Uh, greetings, everyone. Welcome to the 226th session of the online Optum Learning Series OLS. And for today's session, we are very fortunate to welcome back Dr. Karen Delos. Uh, Dr. Karen is the assistant professor at the University of Michigan, Keklog Eye Center, Department of Ophthalmology in Michigan. Uh, her practice primarily focuses on specialty contact lenses for corneal ectasia, as well as for ocular surface diseases. She also sees patients for primary eye care in her clinical practice. She serves on the AOA CLCS Council and also is the vice chair of the Global Specialty Lens Symposium. She is also an advisory board member for the GPLI, the Gas Permeable Lens Institute, and also an advisory member of the Scleral Lens Research uh, Meeting. Uh, her clinical focus, outcomes of specialty contact lenses, as well as on the anterior segment diseases, and she extensively publishes on this subject matter as well in various peer-reviewed journals. And she is also a reviewer for a lot of peer-reviewed journals as well. Uh, she is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry and also a fellow of the Scleral Lens Education Society. And uh, when the Global Specialty Lens Symposium Conference uh, was announced and, you know, we were always keeping up to date on the social media, I just wrote to Dr. Karen and told that, you know, a lot of us would not be able to attend uh, due to the travel distance and the expenses. And she kindly agreed to provide us the insights and highlights from the GSLS meeting and we could arrange this session. So thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Karen for agreeing and accepting our invitation and just let me just leave the screen time to you, please. Thank you so much for that introduction. And um, what I've tried to do today is just give you a little kind of snippet of what what the, the program looks like and what it would be like if you were there. Um, when I was putting this lecture together though, it is really, really hard to sum up other people's lectures. I will tell you that I'm used I'm used to putting my own slides together, my own research. So um, we had over 50 speakers. Um, I, of course, in an hour's time, I'm not able to cover every single thing. So what I did today is I did my best to kind of give you a snapshot of what the program looks like. Um, I will tell you that we have talked many, many times over the years um, about doing um, virtual components. We've done virtual components in the past, so I would always look out for that moving forward because, um, like like you said, it's it's really hard for a lot of people to travel. It's very expensive um, right now to, to travel that far. So thank you so much for joining me. All right. So... What is GSLS? So GSLS stands for Global Specialty Lens Symposium. And this symposium has been going on. It's been named GSLS for over 10 years. And it's really one of the premier programs for exclusively specialty lens um, course content, including um, GP lenses, uh, scleral lenses, specialty soft, and the diseases behind it. Um, the way the program works is we have nine general sessions where that is in a large um, room that holds at least 1,000, 1,200 people. And so we offer nine hours of those courses with several speakers. And then we also have um, what's called breakout sessions, which are smaller, smaller, more intimate settings where you can pick which classes you want to go to. Um, on a variety of topics. So if you are interested more in pediatric specialty lenses, you can go to that one. You can you can kind of pick and choose rather than deciding, having it decided for you. We offered up to 21, you could get 21 hours of education if you attended every the full program and went to every single class. And then we always offer four interactive workshops. Um, and those are you know, really designed to be more informative for those folks who maybe don't have as much experience so that they can get an idea of, of what tools they need and just a basic understand or understanding of everything. 
So this year we had 924 registrants. Um, we also had 224 international attendees. So obviously if you come in the future, you won't be the only non-international uh, uh, person there. And we had 38 countries represented. So our global attendance, of course, we had the most representation from the United States. Um, but you can see we had a fair amount of Canadians, um, with folks from Japan, China, Spain, um, Europe as well, and, and the UK. We had a couple from Taiwan as well. So it was really neat to see um, so much representation. So the GSLS each year um, offers two awards, um, and those awards are intended for um, the, the, the one on your right is the Rising Star Award, which is usually granted to a younger professional who's, who's demonstrated outstanding work within the first 10 years of their um, degree and huge contributions to the field. And this year, that award went to Kevin Chan. And then the big award that we offer every year is the GSLS Awards of Excellence. Um, and this award goes to someone who's had significant contributions in education, research, publications, um, just across the board have, have continued um, to offer an, a, a huge contribution to our field. And this year it went to my former mentor, uh, Jan Bergmanson at the University of Houston. So it was wonderful to um, have that full circle where it was someone that kind of gave you a chance and we were all, we were able to give him the award this year. So that was quite fun. So this is the first year we offered a keynote. So this is um, what I'm going to go through is the, the general sessions, which are the larger sessions that offer, um, you know, large attendance, about 1200 people. Um, and this year we had a keynote. Um, we had Dr. Nathan Efron, who is from uh, uh Queensland University of Technology in Australia. And Dr. Efron spoke to us about the um, if contact lenswear is uh, inflammatory, and he kind of put in intrinsically inflammatory and implications for a specialty lens fitting. So what the way that Dr. Efron presented it is he went through um, kind of the basic tenets of inflammation, um, which goes back to the Roman period, um, Aulus Celsus, I hope I'm doing that just name justice. And the basic tenets are ruber, calor, tumor, and dolor. And then he also added functio laesa, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, which is Roman, which is basically loss of function. So what did those mean? Okay, and how does that apply to um, what Dr. Efron was talking about with respect to, um, you know, the tenets of inflammation? So ruber stands for, is Latin for redness, okay? And so Dr. Efron basically went through several publications where we know that hydrogel soft contact lenses cause redness. Now we saw less of that with the advent of silicon hydrogels. Um, but that was one of the, the primary things that caused redness was lack of oxygen. And so he kind of went through um, how redness can increase, um, is a sign of lack of oxygen, which can be the fueling source in some cases for inflammation. So calor, which translates to heat, um, he offered up information and research and publications about inflammation or um, how contact lenses can increase the heat of the eye, particularly in the limbus and conjunctiva. And again, these steps are leading to the process of inflammation. Tumor, he cited, uh, which is swelling. Hydrogel lenses have a lot of pub publications on um, corneal swelling. We know that contact lenses started out as PMMA material, which had zero oxygen. And of course, now with silicon hydrogels, we're all the way up to a large amount of oxygen. But in the early days of contact lenses, we had a lot of um, concerns with um, corneal swelling and corneal edema. And his um, presentation did put a lot of highlights onto those publications. 
Um, dolor translates to pain. And he cited that, you know, we all know that there's a huge amount of contact lens dropout at a certain age. Um, a lot of our patients report dryness, which he cites as a pain signal. And then fun functiolasia is loss of function, um, where he cited contact lens discontinuation um, as being the source of lo loss of function. So obviously, if you're if you're kind of leading up or ramping up to all these ruber, calor tumor, and do dolor, you're going to lead. That's going to lead you to abandon contact lens wear. Um, he also cited some contact lens um, subclinical indicators. So he cited that um, Langerhans cells will actually increase in their tear film when you're wearing a contact lens. And what he basically kind of presented to us was that the Langerhans cells kind of increase because they sense that there's this foreign body within the eye, but those are protective mechanisms. Um, and also biochemical reactions where the, the lens itself will, inc will increase inflammatory mediators. And Dr. Efren went through basically that these are actually helpful indicators for the eye, the natural eye's response um, on how the eye responds with a foreign body, a contact lens introduced to it. Our next session was, it was really fun. Um, we had Dr. Ed Bennett and then we had Dr. Efron come back and we had a debate um, on soft lenses versus GP lenses. And this is a really lively, fun, um, interactive uh, debate where for people who don't have much attention span, you could kind of watch these two battle it out. Um, so they had um, five topics that they were um, requested to have a point and counterpoint on. So the first one was GPs are nearly extinct. Um, gas permeable should only be taught at the postgraduate level. Gas permeable lenses are a healthier or safer option compared with soft lenses. Orthokeratology is not worth the effort, and gas permeable lenses provide better vision and refractive more and more refractive options than soft lenses. So the first debate topic: GPs are nearly distinct, uh, extinct. So in 2010, Dr. Efron wrote an obituary in uh, Contact Lens and Anterior Eye where he said these lenses, these GP lenses, are completely dead. Um, the, he cited references going all the way back to the 70s where you can see on the, the lower graph that GP lenses have been, you know, decreasing in their prevalence and prescribing habits over the, over the last 30 years. And so at the time, he said, we're no longer going to be needing rigid gas permeable lenses. It's, there's no longer a need. Soft lenses are the way to go. Well, Dr. Uh, Bennett obviously countered with that, and we know that that's not true with specialty lenses. So his counterpoint was to cite, obviously, scleral lenses, and um, the need for specialty lenses uh, has actually increased basically since 2010, um, showing that we really need these lenses Um the, the publications are going up, the amount of, of, um, of uh, prescribing habits is going up. And a lot of that has to do with scleral lenses in the United States. Um, but we know that our keratoconus patients and irregular astigmatism and even dry eye patients can benefit from specialty lenses that are made of GP materials. So it was kind of fun to see little bit from my perspective as a scleral lens fitter that that uh that gp lenses are not actually dead so the next debate topic was gas permeable fitting should be only taught at the postgraduate level so <clears throat> you may have a different training program in your um, neck of the woods but in the u.s um you know optometry school is four years and then you have an optional uh, additional year when you where you can um, do additional training for um, 
areas of specialty such as disease or um, specialty lenses. So Dr. Efron was kind of saying that because um, there is no longer a need for gas permeable lenses, um, that we should just direct all of our education on GP lenses um, to the postgraduate after, after optometry school. Um, many U.S. and Canadian schools cite this as a draw for these programs. Um, but Dr. Bennett, again, was able to counter and say, you know, most of the people that are fitting uh, gas permeable lenses and specialty lenses, um, including those that were in the audience, um, did not receive any postgraduate training, and they're still excellent fitters. So it was kind of nice to see that, um, in my opinion, I, I still think that we should have some basic um, training on how to fit these lenses. It's nice to have additional training, but it's better to have, um, you know, the foundation planted before you um, leave school because you never know where you're going to end up. So the third de debate topic was gas permeable options are healthier and safer compared with soft lenses. Again, lots of publications and um, areas where you can see that um, gas permeable lenses just tend to have a lower rate of microbi microbial keratitis and keratitis and incidences are lower. So that one was a little bit tough for Dr. Efron to argue with because the science is there, the facts are there. A majority of, of um, research says that gas permeable lenses are safer and better options. And of course, in the, in the setting of keratitis, many of the lenses that we fit, particularly scleral lenses, show a decrease. And that's the goal of those lenses is to decrease keratopathy. Fourth topic, orthokeratology is not worth the effort. So Dr. Efren did a, a decent job of arguing that uh, these lenses are not worth the eff effort. He cited that the, the lenses are painful for patients during the waking hours. Of course, orthokeratology lenses, patients are wearing those at night. Um, they're difficult and time consuming to fit. They're expensive per patients and only capable of resolving two diopters uh, of myopia, and that they're a poor alternative to soft lenses. However, Dr. Bennett um, definitely pulled up a litany of tests or studies where he was confirming the efficacy of orthokeratology. He also backed up that uh, orthokeratology can help lenses can have the capability of improving myopia uh, from four to five diopters. It's easily obtainable. If you improve the fit, you're certainly going to improve the comfort. Um, there's min minimal risk involved. There's lots of um, quality of life studies that are out there. And that orthokeratology is, in fact, on the rise rather on the, on the decline in the world. And the fifth topic, gas permeable lenses provide better vision and more refractive options than soft. This is tough to debate. Uh, I think we all know that gas permeable lenses offer better visual acuity outcomes. This is particularly um, viable for our keratoconus patients where we know we don't have an option or don't, don't usually have an option to fit them with soft lenses. And uh, also with our presbyopic patients, you're, you're, definitely going to get crisper vision um, with scleral or GP lenses. The, the counter was that, um, you know, soft lenses are more readily available and we have more options at our fingertips. Um, so mm, kind of a weak argument here, but uh, it was certainly a lively debate and it was fun to see those two get up there and kind of give each other a little bit of a hard time. So our next general session was keratoconus research of the past and clinical indications of the future. Um, we had four speakers, uh, Dr. Loretta Schatzka-Flynn, um, Dr. Uh, Gar Minas Garcina, Garcia out of Spain, uh, Jeff Sonsino um, here in the US, and again, Jan Bergmanson, our award winner to talk about various topics um, within this um, this overarching um, past, present, and future options.
So Dr. Loretta uh, Schatzka Flynn went over the research. So she was one of the primary authors. If many of you have ever seen the Clex study, um, the collaborative longitudinal longitudinal keratoconus carot study, um, she was one of the people and investigators who was involved in that original study. And I would encourage you to look at the Clex study if you haven't seen it. Um, it was the largest publication, largest cohort of keratoconus patients, and it really is the foundation for, for much of what we know about keratoconus today. Um, it was the 20th anniversary of the CLEC study. So a couple of things that she went over is that at this point, you know, historically, we used to say keratoconus was one in 200,000. And I'm sure if you're in the Middle East, um, or if you've seen any of the recent studies, um, we've kind of moved that down to one in 375. Um, I've seen studies um, out of Saudi Arabia and Israel that are saying it's as high as one in 75, um, sometimes one in 20. And the reason that we're seeing that is there's better detection methods. So at the time of the CLEC study, um, they basically had keratometry and slit lamp. Um, so they were grading keratoconus based on bulk striae, um, scarring, and inferior steepening. Um, so that's probably one of the reasons that you're seeing that the prevalence of keratoconus is actually being shifted from one in two hundred or twenty two thousand to one in three seventy five. And the picture on the left is showing those countries that have shifted the increase from from those previously recorded uh, statistics to even higher. So the CLEC study was an area that Dr. Schatzka Flynn also went over where um, out of the CLEC study, um, patients who were less than 17, year old, 17 years old had, with 55 diopters um, as their steep K were at higher risk for progression. And of those uh, patients, they even had a uh, likelihood of increasing by 1.5 diopters in 12 months. So the conclusion was that younger patients demonstrate greater progression. So when you're evaluating patients and you have the younger, the younger the patients diagnosed, the more uh, you need to be um, mindful of those patients potentially progress, uh, progressing very rapidly. So Dr. Sensino um, was tasked with understanding um, keratoconus progression um, and the use of technology. So, um, sorry, this is Dr. Emines Garcia out of Spain. So she has just written um, several publications and did her PhD on the current grading of keratoconus. And there's a general consens cons um, consensus, but really they're, they're, her main point is that a lot of these grading scores for keratoconus and progression are a little bit, there's a, a lot of holes in the data. Um, and her main argument was that progression is, is variable. Um, and the, the current definition of progression is limited. And the reason she's saying that is that um, our image capturing capabilities can vary widely amongst each. If you have a patient that's seen by multiple providers, those imaging um, data points can be different depending on the type of machine that was used to gather it, if it was used on two, two different, if the patient had two different machines. Um, the other th argument that she had is that the more severe the disease is, the, the poor, the, the, equipment is on detecting those outcomes. So the algorithms get weaker, the more progressed uh, the keratoconus is. So her, her main point is that we need kind of more of a stratified effort. And she offered up potentially that we may be using AI in the future to detect the, and characterize keratoconus. So she didn't have any concrete um, evidence. She, I know there's a publication coming out where she um, does kind of support a lot of this, and I would encourage you to look for that. Um, but I would 
as you're um, approaching these patients, I would kind of question um, some of the data points and say, is this really progression or is this a weakness in the, the ability of the equipment to detect um, higher results? Now, Dr. Cincino, uh, so he was the one that um, talked about uh, keratoconus and our fancy equipment that we use and can use these days versus the earlier days of scleral lens fitting and keratoconus. So we know that early, detect early fitting was based on diagnostic fitting. Um, I still use diagnostic fitting, so maybe I'm a bit antiquated. Um, but now we've kind of used more topography and scleral lens to or scleral topography to improve the fitting relationship. So our topograph topographers have gotten better in terms of data capturing. Um, even though I said in the previous person that, that it has weaknesses, it has gotten better overall. We moved from from placido disc to shine shine flug. Um, <clears throat> but also with the scleral topographers, we're able to capture more of the shape of the sclera. And then OCT is, is something that Dr. Sensino uses a lot, um, and he's incorporated that more into his practice where he can better assess the, the fitting relationship of the lens on the eye. Um, he also talked to us about wavefront optics um, and wavefront technology. Um, if you're familiar with OVITS um, and, those, and WAVE, those are um, two areas where the scleral te technology is rapidly evolving where we're able to maybe define um, the vision for patients even a bit more than we than we can. And also the materials um, and coatings are improving. So we've, we'll talk about it in the next session, but the more that we um, know about how these lenses um, interact with the eye, the companies are working very hard to, to improve the material, the, the decay of the material, the polymers, and also the coating. So we've seen HydroPeg as an option <clears throat> to improve the wettability of the lenses. Um, and then cross-linking, of course, and when to incorporate cross-linking has definitely changed the narrative on how we approach these patients. And then finally, Dr. Uh, Bergmanson offered a really wonderful presentation on, you know, should we be cross-linking patients um, and, and particularly pediatric patients? So depending on where you practice in the U.S., um, you know, we typically, the FDA approval is around 18 years old as an adult. But if you've got patients who are progressing um, or need uh, cross-linking, is it safe to start cross-linking these patients at younger age? So um, the the problem is, is that um, <clears throat> the, the limit on cross-linking is not known, meaning we don't know when it's safe and when it's not safe to um, cross like these patients, he cited that the dose of radiation on the eye is 5.4 uh, joules per centimeter, which is not a toxic dose. Um, but is it safe for a pediatric patient? So is that going to have any detrimental effects on the eye in terms of the cornea all the way back to the retina? Um, but you know, should we pr be exposing a young eye to this? Well, he cited that the human cornea is fully developed at age two. Um, so that was interesting to know that, you know, you know, you think of us continually um, growing, but the actual cornea itself, which is the tree and so on, is viable um, potentially at two years of age. So it's more of an ethical consideration. I think it's something that um, you'll be seeing more information on moving forward. One of the um, one of the new uh, general sessions that we did was um, an, a panel discussion and regulation and ethical understanding of the Food and Drug Ad Administration and obstacles. I didn't go into this one in detail because I didn't think it would apply to most of the audience because this is more U.S. based. Um, but we had a, a person who's a lawyer as well as an optometrist and a couple people that are involved in, in the background on how things kind of go through the FDA regulation. And it was interesting to see, um, you know, if you're using any off-label or non-approved um, treatments on how you need to approach your patient care 
And the consensus was you need to be open and honest with your patients if it's not approved um, and kind of cite in your documentation that you discuss that with them as well as the risks, um, alternatives and benefits. So I, again, didn't go into this one much for you guys, but it was really fun to see that debate. So another uh, general session was using technology to maintain health in uh, scleral lenswear. So for this session, we had Dr. Gloria Chu, Dr. Mile Ruzic, uh, Dr. Greg Denaire, and Jan Bartmanson and Ken. So Gloria Chu had a wonderful presentation about um, when you use scleral lenses, it's very, very important to know that it's patient dependent. So knowing the background of the disease and how the disease um, can transcend over as it progresses or gets better and gets worse and whether it can wax and wane. Um, it's disease specific, patient specific and must be customized towards the patient. So she had a lovely presentation about um, ocular shape, um, how you have to consider the shape of the, the, the eye itself. Um, some new technology that's been coming up with um, certain lenses having the ability to do channels that can help with suction and comfort. And she's got some pictures down here on the bottom middle. And then also the ability to um, fit patients who have obstacles on the eyes, such as blebs, um, pinguacula, and those types of things. Um, Dr. Denaire had a really insightful um, presentation on, on the advancement of scleral lens technology. So he kind of uh, focused on the main problems that we encounter daily, which is non-wetting of the surface, um, corneal edema, and midday fogging. So the things that he, you know, honed in on are the materials, like I'd mentioned before. Um, we've had advancement in materials over the years. One of the facts that he he did cover is that even though the materials in the DK have been increasing, um, the DK of the tear film under a scleral lens is only 80. So even if you increase the material DK from, let's say, 100 to 180, it's still not going to change what happens underneath the lens. So he suggested that maybe the, the contact lens manufacturers work on the polymers themselves and how they can work with the um, anatomy and physiology of the eye. The other comments that he had were the surface treatments. Um, the polyethylene glycol uh, coatings have improved, but if you've used any of those, they do have their limitations. So while the advancement is there, um, one of the things he suggested is we work on the wetting angle of the lenses so that the tear film can spread more evenly across it. Um, and those with dysfunctional tear films, maybe we look at other options on how we can improve the surface treatments of those lenses. He did cover soft lens use with scleral lens. So there are some patients who, you know, have these have debris that accumulate on the front surface. And so there's been a couple practitioners who have suggested putting a soft daily disposable over those lenses, over the scleral lenses to help with the debris accumulation. And they can simply just change the, the soft lens out. Um, I don't use that in my practice. Um, my concern is corneal edema and loss of oxygen. Um, but he, he kind of had some interesting cases on that. Um, we've had advancements in our filling solutions as well for scleral lenses. Um, at the very beginning, we used to fill those lenses with 0.9% sodium chloride, but um, there's been a few changes in, in FDA approved, again, FDA approved filling solutions like sclerophyll and neutrophil, which are uh, neutrophil is electrolyte based, um, so it mimics the tear film. And the concern with many of these is um, many of the, some of them are not pH balanced for the eye versus other filling solutions are more pH balanced for the eye. So when you're considering filling solutions, I would encourage you to look at um, how they're different, um, specifically the pH. Um, sodium chloride, the pH can be quite low and could be potentially long-term toxic to the eye, but we don't know. 
And then finally, scleral shape and design. Um, you know, again, we know that the the eye is not rotationally symmetric. And so with our advancement in our knowledge and our research, we have improved our fitting techniques. And then Dr. Um, Brujic brought up a, a, some wonderful um, supporting evidence to use OCT. Again, OCT is not something that I use. Um, uh, probably a lot of people don't have access to it, but OCT can offer a wonderful visual on potentially how the lens is fitting on the eye. But more importantly, um, looking at the limbus and, and whether we're clearing the limbus. And the reason that's important is we want to make sure that the eyes... Um, cells that kind of regenerate the cornea in the palisades evoked the limbal stem cells we want to make sure that we're not suffocating those cells and that those cells are able to get the nutrients that they need so he did have a, a wonderful presentation to show that oct can really help to visualize how those lenses are fitting on the eye so a couple areas where he was able to kind of highlight the fitting relationship you can see the top left picture where you've got um, excess pressure pushing in the eye and the right is showing um, an actual visual OCT on where that fitting relationship um, compresses the eye and where that where you could punch, potentially lift things up. The bottom is um, looking at OCT in terms of um, scleral uh, oxygen and, and the flow. And I think this is something that we're going to see moving forward as a as a new benefit. So we want to literally visualize those those um, the the uh, the veins and and capillaries that are delivering the oxygen and make sure that they are also getting the supply source that they need. Um, our one of our other tenants that we like to hit in terms of bullet points in G in GSLS is looking at, we want to look at uh, um, our, the diseases, uh, sclera lenses, GP lenses, but we also make sure that we cover myopia. So our next session was uh, top technologies to crack the myopia code. So Dr. Uh, Fu out of um, Singapore highlighted um, many of you are aware of the ADAM studies, um, and those studies looked at atropine. And basically, those studies concluded that 0.1% uh, atropine was capable of reducing myopia um, progression by 50 to 60%, and it's better in the second year. She also highlighted the LAMP study, which is another famous study regarding myopia management, you, with particularly looking at the use of 0.5% um, atropine um, and that this was a superior therapy um, in terms of efficacy and continue, and the more you continue or the longer you continue that on, the, the better the results are. But she did argue that there's a need for personal treatment. So although atropine is wonderful, um, combining the treatments. So if you're looking at bifocal contact lenses or spectacles, combine with atropine seems to be where the trends are going recently. Dr. Bullimore, Mark Bullimore, if you haven't he seen him speak, he's wonderful. I would highly encourage you to look um, at anything that he's done. He's done a lot of research on this field. And so he um, kind of be, hones in on axial length as being your key determinant of myopia progression and that you really need to be looking at axial length more in depth as your metric for myopia progression. Um, he cites that it's better sensitivity and the mean ratio of progression is 2.0 diopters per millimeter. Um, it's ethnically dependent. So Asians <clears throat> have a higher um, rate of axial length elongation, but it's age independent. And then Dr. Thacker out of Canada um, also talked to us about a lot of cool um, new glasses options that are now available. And I didn't know this, but I thought there was only one um, type of uh, spectacle that um, has kind of a central 
um, clear option and then it blurs out through the center, but there's four different options and she went through that. Now, I'm not a myopia person, so I apologize. I don't think I did it any justice on these, but just kind of laying out there and you may have different availability or access to things throughout the world, but there's different options. But basically, the majority of them have a central clear ring um, where the patient can focus through. But the the concept is to, is to um, blur out peripheral defocus so that that peripheral defocus has been shown to be effective um, for maintaining uh, myopia and managing it. And then finally, Dr. Um, Richard Wu um, talked about improving patient outcomes with technology. Um, And he really focused on image capturing. So um, on your left there on the top is a good image, but the second, um, the in the Bottom one is showing that there's an inferior um, image quality capture. But he also used several examples of how you can um, look at um, your images to show how you're, how you're treating, um, treating outcomes are improving by having better image capturing. So the posters um, are another session, and this is a great opportunity um, for people to get involved and highlight the work that they're doing um, throughout the world. And this is it's just a fun one. Um, this year we had 140 um, accepted submissions. The topics um, were on a variety of things such as scleral lenses, myopia management, um, higher order aberrations and disease. We also offered three prizes in three categories. So research, clinical, and residence. Um, If you are interested, those posters are all available online. Um, And then for the past two years, we've offered a rapid fire session, which again is back in the main auditorium. Um, They select, the committee selects eight um, of the top posters. And these folks get an opportunity in a short period of time to really quickly give you an insight into what they've been doing, what the outcomes of their posters were. And it's really a fun way for people to get involved. It's always always a well-received session. Um, We also, because we get so many submissions, we, we, we hate turning people down, and I'll tell you how it works. Um, But we did offer this year another rapid fire on um, the smaller breakout sessions where these sessions were submitted um, abstracts, but they maybe were a little too um, narrow in terms of their scope. But we did a rapid fire again where these folks got eight minutes to go through what would have been our presentation, but give us kind of a snippet on, on what they wanted to present and the outcomes of of their presentations. It was really fun. Um, We had um, pemphigoid, uh, we had surgical considerations and suture considerations, um, pediatric management, and then Daddy Fidel um, did a wonderful presentation on geriatric and special populations such as mentally challenged. Uh, We also have five, another session on the scientific papers. In the interest of time, I'm just gonna fly through these, but we, again, have folks that submit paper um, submissions, and this is an opportunity for them to highlight um, their manuscript and go a little bit more in depth. I believe they get about 10, 15 minutes where they share with the audience the the research, the outcomes of the research, and then, of course, publications are the end result of all these papers. So I mentioned that we have workshops um, we've been doing workshops now for about two or three years, and they can range. Traditionally, workshops um, in optometry have soot lamps and lenses, and you're putting lenses on the eye. But other types of workshops are more interactive, where it's more of a brainstorming, like ability to interact with the speaker rather than the speaker um, kind of talking at you. It's more of an intimate setting where the audience is you know, definitely involved in everything in terms of the discussion points. So our four workshops this year were an imaging workshop where we brought in a mul- multitude of equipment. So the, the newest scleral topographers, um, the myopia management topographers and imaging. Um, we had slit lamp cameras, 
um, you name it, we had brought it all in so that we could have live demonstrations and folks could go around to each station and have um, just a just a brief tutorial on how it works and and capability of seeing live capturing. We also had an orthokeratology workshop where uh, Dr. Anith Palai and Jennifer Har Harthen went through um, a lot of troubleshooting on orthokeratology. So here's a patient, this is how it works, this is what happened, but how did we fix it? And then again, interacting with the attendees on how can we work on improving this fit? What do you think? Um, the Sclera Lens Education Society offered a troubleshooting workshop, again, looking at specific cases where perhaps things didn't go as well, um, and asking the audience, how do we fix this? What are some considerations? And then finally, we had our first um, scleral lens troubleshooting. It was in English and Spanish. This one was really fun. We had um, folks presenting in Spanish and had subtitles available. Again, similar to the scleral lens workshop where you're kind of in the trenches. How do things go wrong? How do we improve them when, when, th when we get stuck? So I mentioned before that um, there's small courses. Um, we had 18 breakout sessions this year. Um, topics included myopia management, keratoconus, sclera lenses, and practice management. Um, because these, we usually have about four or six sessions running at the same time, you may not, you're not able to attend all, you have to pick one, but we did repeat three sessions this year. Um, and we also had two master classes. I only listed one there. We had one on sclera lenses and one on um, myopia management, where master classes, again, are, are more intended to be um, fundamental and introductory. So those were very well received this year. Um, I mentioned the master classes, uh, special lens applications where Dottie Fidel and Melissa Barnett went through the highlights of um, of a typical scleral lens fitting, um, piggyback designs, when to use oblate designs for higher myopia, prism, which can be done vertically and horizontally, ptosis, where you have a patient who has a lid lag and you can prop it up, and then also um, optic decentration for patients that um, need to opti optimize vision um, in terms of higher order aberration and wavefront optics, and also um, multifocal designs. Doctors, we had Canada here, um, Dr. Powell and Sheila Morrison um, went through just soup to nuts, the beginning, the end on myopia management and clinical practice, pharmacological treatments, spectacle and contact lens options, and also lifestyle modifications. Um, they also went through, you know, real world safety considerations. Um, so what are the best practices? What are the commonly accepted um, myopia management um, treatment options? What are the less commonly accepted options? Um, they also went through tips on talking to both patients and parents. And then a collaborative approach on how to bridge the conversations with ophthalmologists as well as pediatricians. Dr. Dave Kading had a wonderful presentation on AI. I don't think there's anyone on this lecture who is not at least using AI, curious about AI, but he went through a lot of the pros and cons on um, AI, um, pros being that we can improve diagnostic diagnosis, perhaps personalized care um, with patient-centered outcomes, and you're integrating technology. But the cons, um, you know, there's always gonna be ethical considerations with AI. Um, we don't wanna be dependent on AI or maybe that's a risk. Um, and also patients' data safety and security when, when things are going out into the cloud, how do we know that someone's not hacking into your information um, and using it for not so great purposes? Doctors Hamadi and Morrison, um, had a lovely presentation again on scleral lens fitting techniques, um, what to do when your patients are, you know, you go from a wonderful fit to they come back with all of these issues and how to troubleshoot each of those. Again, I'm kind of skipping through everything because I'm running out of time. Um, Dr. 
uh, Chu went through a lovely, wonderful presentation where she went through how to, if you know nothing about keratoconus, if you've been practicing for years, what are the key things that you need to do? And she centered a lot on, you know, tailoring your patient treatments towards the actual patient, which I think is a great way to approach things. So, you know, pearls, uh, if the patient's not 2020, they have poor endpoints, um, poor answers on the refraction. So if you don't have any equipment, this is how you can get started. Um, changes over time, an asymmetric cylinder between the left and right eye. Um, complaints of starburst, starburst itching, monocular diplo diplopia. Um, and then she went through the exam components. So a, a consultation, um, educating the, the family and the patient and listening to the patient concerns, um, offering support, um, resources, and educating the patient on, on avoiding bad habits and, and treatment options for them. And then a really big important um, thing that we need to, to hone in on is family history. So asking if there's any other family members that have a history of keratoconus or potentially will have um, a risk for keratoconus moving forward. Um, Dr. Wynn went through challenges in fitting pediatric patients, um, whether they're adolescent keratoconus patients. Um, she went through some deep, um, some cases of amblyo amblyopic occlusive lenses, um, where you can occlude the lens, the eye with a, a contact lens and offer um, amblyopic treatments. Aphakia, and we know that aphakia these days usually comes with comorbidities and how to troubleshoot those. So esotropia, glaucoma, et cetera, and how to manage those patients. This one is uh, specialty lenses with uh, low vision patients. Um, these are my colleagues, Dr. Day and Dr. Wicker. And it's one of those things you don't think about, but um, sometimes you need a team approach with low vision. Um, and they offered support in terms of, um, you know, we sometimes we need uh, specialty lenses to improve the vision, but those patients have comorbidities and they have low vision needs. So yes, you can improve the vision um, up to a certain point, but then we may need to team up with our low vision colleagues so that we can optimize their vision um, and then maximize the vision, the vision for low vision adaptive devices for telescopes, um, anything else that the low vision folks can offer to us. And lastly, um, we one of the biggest things that we offer is the manufacturer session. So every company will come in and actually offer a very in-depth insight into their specific products. And I find that a lot of people, a lot of attendees love hearing about these. So obviously had, we had Bosch and Lum who came in, gave us the, the latest and greatest on their technology with respect to the Zen lens and the bi-elevation and the edge lens. Um, Johnson & Johnson had a wonderful presentation on um, myth busters in myopia management. Oculus, uh, which is an image capturing device, um, gave us some insights on their equipment, troubleshooting their, with their equipment and image capturing and scleral prophilometry. Um, Wave contact lens system, uh, if you're not familiar, is a topography-based system for orthokeratology, um, where attendees were able to learn what that can do for them and how to incorporate topography to help with myopia management. Cooper Vision, they are doing amazing work in terms of myopia management, um, but also they have the largest line of specialty lenses. So how their products can, can help you out and the tools assisting with scleral lens fitting. Euclid Vision um, has a new lens out if you haven't seen it or hopefully if you have access to it, which you may not, the tangent system and how um, their fitting system can help you maintain alignment with a sclera. And then, sorry, I went through this real quick. So um, lastly, um, we went through and, and pulled everyone um, and the future topics of what we want to cover. Um, we, we asked people and a lot of it you can see was new technology and trends, keratoconus, um, ocular disease and myopia management. 
Um, so how can you get involved? Um, if you're interested, if you want to mark your calendars, it's always held in January. We'll be at the Horseshoe next year. I would encourage you to look for, if you're not a subscriber to Contact Lens today, you can you can um, look for updates on that. And then Contact Lens Spectrum is probably your best resource. Um, so in April, Contact Lens Spectrum will offer a digital and printed version of the highlights from GSLS. <clears throat> I mentioned contact lens today, but this is a great resource if you don't get it. It's a weekly e-newsletter where it goes over um, so potentially some of the highlights and upcoming events for um, GSLS. If you want to get involved, look for um, future advertisements on um, early submissions for where we always, the way that we pick speakers is through abstract submissions. So if you're interested in speaking or even interested in, in submitting a poster, I would encourage everyone to at least consider it. Um, we want to make sure that we're inclusive of everyone and we want people to get involved. Um, I'd love to see, I'd love to hear from all of you on, on what you want to see moving forward. So let's see. Myopia, we got one person, that's great. So perhaps as we're waiting, a couple more things will come in. But I, I would love to hear from other people on, on what they want to um, learn about. So orthokeratology, cornea, I assume that's cornea uh, physiology and scleral lenses. That's great. Um, we definitely try to, to capture all of these. But if you if there's something that you guys want to hear about, the only way the education committee knows what to, to provide in terms of education is from hearing from you. So I'm going to switch to a different screen again. So if you in the future do want to um, do have some ideas, I would encourage you to reach out to me. Um, let me get, I'm going to, it's not expanded. Let me do that real quick. I apologize. But this is how you can get a hold of me. I'm on LinkedIn. You can email me. But honestly, we always want to make sure that we're including everyone. The title was a global specialty lens. So we want it to be global. So if there's any questions, um, feel free. It looks like there's a couple in the chat room. I'm happy to stay on for a little bit longer. Um, looks like, yeah, people are still um, including their answers too. So this is great. Um, but yeah, if it care to conus management, that's a great idea. Um, and AI, I still be in under, under investigation. Vision therapy, that's a great one. Um, so yeah, I definitely, if you have any ideas, if there's anything that I can ever help with, happy to do so. I think right on time. We are, yes. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Karen, for taking us through, I think, uh, the entire program. And probably I think it's a teaser for the next year because the way you presented it, it makes me like feel like uh, I should attend and we should attend the next time, right? So thank you so much for sharing the new insights plus, uh, you know, uh, things for the future as well. Yeah, thank you for having me and everyone. Thanks for coming today. And a couple of questions which came in directly to me, but I think uh, you did cover people. Two of them wanted to know when uh, is the next GSLS, uh, which you said it's going to be early uh, in February, early next year, right? January. So it's January. It's January. Yeah. It will be in Las Vegas. Um, it's usually somewhere uh, around anywhere after the 15th of January. Um, I don't know that we've announced dates uh, due to contract, but um, it will. So usually around April, May, June is when you're going to start to see those advertisements. Right. Yeah. But to block your calendars, it will be somewhere in January 2025. Exact dates would be announced later, right? Yep. And we'll be at the Horseshoe um, in Las Vegas again. Las Vegas. Yeah. Awesome. Great. Uh, the other one which kind of came in, uh, I think you did also cover, it's a three-day full-pack conference. Uh, is that right? Yeah. Yep. 
So um, it's usually three days. Um, your registration would cover all of it. So you have, you know, one thing I didn't cover, <laughs> this is a really important one for me, food. Uh, we have wonderful food. So you will have um, definitely lunches in the exhibit hall. Um, sometimes we have uh, food in the exhibit hall, like heavy appetizers in the evening. So if you're concerned about cost, you can you know, reduce the cost a little bit by your registration will cover some of your meals as well. So maybe that's another potential draw for some folks. And uh, I think this one just also come in directly to me. I'm just going to read out. Is there any special uh, prices for student registrations or in terms of registration fees? Um, so if you get, if your poster, for example, gets uh, accepted, there's a discount on the registration. Um, if you're a speaker, you have a discount. So, and then there are additional prizes. So you get a discount on registration if your poster is accepted. So that's a, all the more reason to maybe submit posters. Um, but additional awards are are granted for people if if they do you know if they're in the top three of those those three categories that I mentioned. Yeah, awesome, great. So I think with that we have taken uh, questions up which popped up on the chat, uh, and uh, please feel free to contact us or Dr. Karen. Uh, I think she has shared her. Uh, contact details, the LinkedIn, as well as an email. So if there's anything, please do reach out to us. And if uh, we would be happy to help in anything which uh, is under our consideration. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Karen, for joining us today and taking us through uh, the highlights of the GSLS 2024 and uh, spending your Sunday morning with us. <laughs> I'm off to have breakfast and more coffee now. So thanks, everyone. <laughs> Most welcome. So, and we do have session planned over the next weekends. We will, until then, take care, be safe, and have a good day or a good evening ahead. Take care and bye bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye.